When you ask people who were the most influential blues artists when it came to the formation and creation of rock and roll, you'll get a variety of different answers. People like Blind Lemon Jefferson, Sun House, Sonny Boy Williamson, even B.B. King, and those answers aren't wrong. But I think there are three names that would appear near the top of almost everyone's list. Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters, and Howlin' Wolf. And listen, I'm not saying that their influence on rock and roll was the only reason we should care about them. Their music was powerful and important in its own right, regardless of what it influenced. But I think their influence on rock and roll was kind of the most important, lasting impact of their legacy. Rock and roll changed the musical world, and it wouldn't have been the same without those three guys and a plethora of other blues artists. And I think of those three, Howlin' Wolf is often the most overlooked. Robert Johnson has the whole devil mythology and Muddy Waters has that kind of like name associated to him. So people kind of pass over Howlin' Wolf and I think that's a travesty. So this is the story of Howlin' Wolf and how important and amazing of an artist he was. If you end up liking this video, remember to give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss more stories from music history. Also, this video is a bit of a departure for me from recent videos. I think most people probably know this channel for kind of like the punk and punk adjacent content I've been putting out recently, but I don't want it to just be a punk channel. I want to talk about all kinds of music. So this is kind of an effort to shed more light on different styles that you might not know. So even if you don't really care all that much about blues music, I think it's still a really interesting story. So stick around, check it out, see if you might enjoy it. And let me know of any other blues artists that I should check out and potentially do a video like this on. All my life. Chester Arthur Burnett was born on June 10th, 1910, near West Point, Mississippi. He was born in, like, a small town called White Station, and White Station's Wikipedia page basically only says that it was the birthplace of Howlin' Wolf. He was named after Chester A. Arthur, but despite that presidential connection, Chester Burnett was born into a world of racial segregation, racist violence, and Jim Crow laws, because it was Mississippi in 1910. His father, Leon Burnett, was a sharecropper who went by the name of Doc. Doc was born nearby in Aberdeen, which I only know is a Scottish football team that keeps beating me on Football Manager. Chester was born when his dad, Doc, was only 18 years old. Chester's mother, Gertrude, was born in Shukwalak, which could also be the Scottish football team, I don't know, in June of 1894, meaning she was almost 16 when her son Chester was born. Chester spent most of his early life in just crushing poverty. Sharecroppers weren't exactly rolling in the money, and his mother worked as a cook and as a maid to try and help some ends meet. When he was younger, Chester's grandfather, Gertrude's father, who was a Native American, used to scare young Chester with tales about the wolves that would hunt the forest nearby. Chester said, quote, I was bad about getting my grandfather mother's little chickens. Every time I'd get one, I didn't have enough sense to just hold him. I'd squeeze him and kill him. I got so bad about it, they told me they was going to have to put the wolf on me. So everybody else went to calling me the wolf." End quote. So that's how he originally got his nickname, The Wolf, but he told a different story throughout the years. He later claimed that he got the name from Jimmy Rogers, who was a songwriting hero of his, and a lot of these blues musicians, their early lives in particular, are just kind of shrouded in a whole lot of mythology, so it gets kind of hard to untangle where things actually came from. When he was only a year old, Chester's father, Doc, left the family. He had been going back and forth to the Mississippi Delta to work on plantations there, and he left the family to move full-time to the Mississippi Delta in order to get more stable work. So Wolf and his mother moved a little bit north into Monroe County where his mother became kind of like fanatically religious and started bringing Chester along to church with her. That's where he first started singing in the choir and singing these little like spirituals and gospel hymns with his mother. But then when he was still quite young, Gertrude kicked her son out of the house. And I don't think we'll ever really know the full story as to why she did that. There were different competing accounts through the years. Wolf later told a friend of his that his mother got super angry when he refused to work in the fields all day, and that's why she kicked him out. There was another account that she was mad that he wanted to play blues music instead of singing the spirituals and the hymns. There was also another story that Gertrude found a new boyfriend who didn't like the wolf at all. I think there's probably an element of truth in most of those stories, and... 
they all kind of played some role without one being the ultimate deciding factor. Either way, Gertrude kicked him out and he walked for miles until he got to the house of Will Young, who was his great uncle. And when he got there, things didn't necessarily get any better for Young Chester. He was forced to work basically all day in the field, so he didn't go to school and didn't really get any kind of education. Whenever he messed up, Will would often abuse Wolf and sometimes he would hit him with a bullwhip, sometimes he would force him to go hungry, so the wolf would walk the train tracks looking for any kind of discarded food that the workers would leave there. Lucy Wiseman, who wasn't related to the family, but the Youngs took her in when she was a toddler, said, quote, Will would whoop you if you didn't do right. He used to whoop Chester a lot. In fact, he whooped all of us if we didn't obey. I don't think he knew any better. End quote. But while working in the fields, he also started to develop his musical style. He would sing while he walked behind the mules that were plowing, and he would have this like little bucket that he would start drumming on. And he'd often get harmonicas for Christmas because they were super cheap. So he fell in love with those little harmonicas and started to teach himself how to play it. And then in 1923, Wolf had grown really tired of his life with Will Young. And after accidentally killing one of Will's prized hogs, Instead of staying and facing the probably severe punishment, Wolf ran away. After running away, he traveled into the Mississippi Delta, where he finally found his father, Doc. Doc was working on the Young and Morrow Plantation, which was on the Quiver River, which is an excellent name for a river. In the years since he had left his family, Doc had become a nice, caring man that everyone in the community looked up to and respected and liked. And he was very quick to take Wolf in and finally give him, like, a loving, caring parental presence in his life. So at the age of 13, he finally had a father figure that didn't appear to hate him. You know I'm the wolf, baby. You and then around 1927, his life changed when he saw Charlie Patton playing the guitar. Charlie was born in 1891 in Mississippi, and he quickly established himself as one of the most important of that kind of first generation of Delta blues musicians. Charlie was an incredible guitar player, but what really set him apart was his stage performances. He would play with the guitar like behind his back or between his legs or just really any of these stage antics that are kind of old hat for rock stars now, but no one else was doing at that time. Wolf would listen to him play almost nightly at a local juke joint and just fell in love with what he was doing. Wolf said, quote, I was plowing four mules on the plantation and a man came through there picking a guitar called Charlie Patton, and I liked his sound, so I got him to show me a few chords, end quote. And because of this interest in blues music and Charlie Patton, in January of 1928, Doc bought Wolf his first guitar. And since Wolf was a rather large man, man with rather large hands, playing the guitar didn't come naturally to him. He had to work on it really hard. But he loved it, and he spent basically all of the free time he could playing the guitar and hanging out with Charlie Patton to learn from him and to play with him. When Wolf heard Jimmy Rogers for the first time, he was super interested in that kind of like yodeling style of singing that Jimmy Rogers did, so he tried to copy that, but in his own kind of way. And that's how he developed his signature howl. He said, quote, I took that idea and adapted it to my own abilities. I couldn't do no yodeling, so I turned to howling, end quote. So by learning Charlie Patton's guitar playing and showmanship, by developing this Jimmy Rogers-inspired howling, and by just being an imposing, large-looking man, he started to make a name for himself and a reputation playing the juke joints and the bars in the area. But he hadn't quite settled on what his good performer name would be. He played as John D., John D. Burnett, Foots and Buford, but he also used Howlin' Wolf basically from the beginning of his playing time. Some people claim that he took his name from a 1930 record by Funny Papa Smith called Howling Wolf Blues, but several people who knew him back then claimed that he was going by Howling Wolf as early as 1928, long before that record came out. By traveling with and playing with Charlie Patton, Wolf got to meet and perform with some of the biggest names in the Delta Blues. But these venues and juke joints they were playing in weren't always the safest places to be. Another Another blues musician named Johnny Shines said, quote, Now a juke joint is a place where people go to play cards, gamble, drink, and so on. Beer was served in cups, whiskey you had to drink out of a bottle. See, they couldn't use mugs in there because the people would commit mayhem, tear people's heads up with those mugs. Rough places they were. End quote. And as quite a few of those musicians did, Wolf found his fair share of trouble in those juke joints, mostly from stealing other people's girlfriends. He was quite the ladies' man when he wanted to be. But then that kind of led to a really dark moment in his life. Wolf had a fling with a woman in Arkansas, and when her boyfriend found out about it, he beat her up pretty severely, which Wolf really didn't like, so he found the man and hit him in the head with a hoe, 
which killed him. Wolf never publicly talked about this incident or really brought it up in private all that much, so it's hard to know the exact details of what happened, if it happened at all, but some of his closest friends mention him talking about it. Johnny Shines claimed to have been there when it happened and said that Wolf avoided prison time, but Sunnyland Slim, who's another musician who toured and played with Wolf, said that Wolf spent two years in prison for it. And then one time when Sunnyland was playing in Wolf's band, he brought it up during an argument that he was having with Wolf, and Wolf appeared very shaken about it and just kind of like got out of the car and started walking away. Hubert Sumlin, who was Wolf's longtime guitarist at that point, found Wolf and kind of asked him what was what was that? Wolf told Hubert that it was true and he had hit a man in the head with a hoe and it had sliced the top part of his head off. Wolf then hid in a drainage ditch while a posse of people looked for him, and the next day some of his friends helped smuggle him out of the town. So when he wasn't getting into trouble, Wolf spent a lot of time traveling around the Mississippi Delta region, playing with other massively popular blues musicians like Sonny Boy Williamson II, Son House, and he even spent some time traveling and playing with Robert Johnson. But I'll probably do a separate video on Robert Johnson, so subscribe so you don't miss that one. But sometime in the 30s, he met a guitarist who had become a longtime collaborator with him, Willie Johnson. Willie was born in 1923 in Mississippi, so he was still a teenager when he met Wolf, and he was still learning how to play the guitar. But the Wolf saw something in the young player and invited him to play one night, and that started a long working relationship. Even though he was making a little bit of a name for himself playing in these local juke joints, he still needed to make some money. I mean, the Delta Blues musicians weren't making much playing these different venues. I think Wolf said sometimes he would play for like a fish sandwich. So he would return home and he would help dock in the fields, and then he went to work as a sharecropper on a plantation in Pace, Mississippi, where he met Elvin Frazier. And then in June of 1939, Elvin gave birth to Wolf's son named Floyd. But Wolf had already fled from Pace, Mississippi after getting in trouble for allegedly hooking up with a married white woman so he wouldn't meet his son for several years. In 1941, Wolf did what a lot of young men were doing at that time and he entered the army. Wolf later claimed that it wasn't his idea and the local plantation owners had kind of forced him into it because he had found a way to circumvent this whole system they established and make money while not working in the fields full time. They thought he'd be a bad influence on the other sharecroppers and so they wanted to get him out of that community. Wolf was stationed at a few different places around the country and he really struggled with his time in the military. He wasn't ready for the discipline and the rigidity of military life, so he was assigned to kitchen duty. And then he started having what I believe were anxiety attacks, but at the time were called spells of dizziness and nervousness, so he was given an honorable discharge in 1943. He later told people that he was shell-shocked in the military even though he never came anywhere close to any kind of combat. He said, quote, I stayed in the army three years, I'd done all my training, you know, I liked the army alright, but they put so much on a man, you know what I mean? My nerves couldn't take it, end quote. But I did see some accounts to say he was kind of like physically and brutally punished when the army tried and failed to teach him how to read and write, so maybe that played some role in his feeling shell-shocked or nervous or whatever was going on with him. In 1947, when he was 36, he decided to settle down and he married Katie Mae Johnson. He was still playing music, but his appeal to his female fans was a little bit different after he got married and his marriage allowed him kind of a stable place to live and to raise his son Floyd. By 1948, things were starting to shift in the blues scene, and Wolf was really good at changing with the times. He moved to West Memphis, turned electric, and assembled the best electric blues band that he could find. And, of course, he kept Willie Johnson on guitar. He said, quote, It was there in 1948 when I formed my first band and began to follow music as a career. End quote. It was also in West Memphis that Wolf would first meet and perform with Hubert Sumlin, and the two would later form one of the greatest partnerships in blues history. His band quickly became one of the best and most sought after blues bands in West Memphis. I mean, venues would be packed out every time he played them. And then in 1949, he landed a radio spot on KWEM. He even like went around to local businesses to drum up some advertisement for his own radio show. And while his career was growing and he was taking these next steps, he suffered some personal tragedy. His father passed away from stomach cancer and so he lost the most stable, loving parental figure he had ever had. But despite that, his musical life was about to change forever. Because in 1951, Sam Phillips tuned in to Wolf's radio show. 
Sam said, quote, A disc jockey from West Memphis told me about Chester Burnett's show on KWEM, and I tuned him in. When I heard Howlin' Wolf, I said, this is for me, end quote. Sam Phillips was born in Alabama in 1923 and had grown up around blues and gospel music since he grew up on a farm. Eventually, he found his way to working at a radio station where he got a job in Memphis as an engineer for live big band shows. Then, in 1950, he opened his own recording studio where local musicians could come in and record their songs. That was the studio that a young Elvis Presley first walked into to record a song as a present for his mother. Sam Phillips and his whole recording enterprise deserves way more time than I can give him in this video, so that might be another video as well if people want it, so subscribe so you don't miss that one. Anyway, this guy with a deep love for blues music, his own recording studio, and powerful connections in both Chicago and LA heard the wolf and loved him. So he invited Wolf to come record whenever he wanted. Eventually, Wolf took him up on that offer and he came and recorded a couple demos, which Sam then sent to the Chess Brothers in Chicago. And that's when things really took off. Sam already had a pretty good relationship with the Chess Brothers in Chicago. He would send them records that he thought would do well and then the Chess Brothers could distribute them. Sam had already sent them Rocket 88, which would become a big hit for Chess. So they were willing to trust him a little bit on this Howlin' Wolf character. And they asked him for a full recording session. So in the summer of 1951, Howlin' Wolf recorded his first two singles. By the end of the year, Moanin' at Midnight had hit the charts in several major markets like Dallas and Atlanta, and had even broken in to the national R&B charts. The Chess Brothers recognized the potential of Howlin' Wolf, so they strongly encouraged him to come to Chicago where they could more fully control his musical career. In the winter of 1952, Wolf took the plunge and he moved north to Chicago. He said, quote, I came here to cut the records and I've been going ever since in the business. I left the other guys back in West Memphis and came up to Chicago by myself. They was afraid to take the chance, end quote. Presumably, Wolf was talking about his band that he had carefully assembled and taught and grew with in West Memphis, and they didn't want to go to Chicago, so he left them behind. But he also could have been talking about his family, because they also did not make the journey with him to Chicago. His marriage was already kind of rocky, so by him moving to Chicago, it effectively ended it, and his wife would pass away from breast cancer a few years later. Sam Phillips probably took Wolf's departure the hardest. He really loved Wolf's sound, and he thought he could be something incredible and special, and he felt like the Chess Brothers let him down a little bit. He said, quote, I don't think they heard in the wolf what I heard. I believed in him so much that I would have worked hard to that end that he was heard by a lot more people than he was heard by, end quote. He thought that if Wolf had stayed at Sun Records and stayed in Memphis, he could have been as big as Elvis. But Wolf was in Chicago in an exclusive artist of Chess Records. She thought it left me. She thought to stay. Again, Chess probably deserved its own video, so... I'll do a full background on Leonard Chess and that whole situation because it's a really fascinating story. Speaking of other videos I need to make, one of the first people that Wolf ran into when he got to Chicago was Muddy Waters, who was the current king of the Chicago blues and the current number one artist on Chess Records. Muddy was pretty hospitable and he took Wolf around to the different blues clubs and introduced him to the owners and all their other people he needed to know in the Chicago blues scene. When Muddy went on tours, Wolf would step in and perform his regular spots, kind of like subletting a blues performance. And carrying on with what he was doing in West Memphis, Wolf knew that he needed to assemble another superstar band, so he got working on that right away. One of the first people he turned to was the young guitarist he met in West Memphis, Hubert Sumlin. Hubert was born in Mississippi but raised in Arkansas, and when he was like seven years old, his mother bought his older brother a guitar, and Hubert became obsessed with it. So his mom saved up enough money to also buy him a guitar. He started taking it with him when he worked in the fields, and he never stopped playing it. Along with Hubert, Hubert Wolf also called up Willie Johnson to join the band. Muddy quickly came to regret the introductions that he gave Wolf in the town because Wolf's band and his stage antics made him a much bigger draw than I think Muddy was expecting, and he quickly started to compete for that title of King of the Chicago Blues. Wolf started to take over more and more of Muddy's regular gigs, and this led to something of a feud developing between the two of them. They both wanted to be the best blues musicians in Chicago and the world, and neither of them were willing to take second place. I also think Muddy might have had a little bit of a superiority complex because Wolf was getting some of the same criticism that his teacher, Charlie Patton, used to get, saying that he wasn't really a blues musician. He was a clown with his, like, 
crawling on the floor stage antics and playing the guitar behind his back and all that kind of stuff. People thought he wasn't taking it seriously and he was more of a freak show than he was an actual serious musician. And I think Muddy probably bristled against that a little bit. By 1955, Wolf was well established in Chicago and he was recording singles that were charting really well, at least on the R&B charts. Backed by a massively talented band and unleashing these unheard of stage antics that he learned from Charlie Patton, Wolf was taking over the blues world. He was also smart enough to keep doing regular tours down south, which kept the audience that he carefully built really alive down there. But Muddy wasn't just going to roll over and let Wolf take the crown from him, so he did all he could to kind of upset that, including pulling Hubert away from Wolf. Hubert was feeling like Wolf wasn't appreciating him enough, and Muddy was willing to pay more, so he left Wolf's band to join Muddy's band, which was a betrayal that Wolf couldn't handle, and I think he felt more betrayed by Muddy stealing his musicians than he did by Hubert. I think he kind of understood that Muddy can pay more, so that makes sense. I think he was more upset that Muddy was willing to steal his guitar player. But not too long after, Hubert got into a little bit of a fight with Muddy, so he left to rejoin Wolf's band. Hubert said, quote, Things were never right between him and Wolf, though. Ever since Wolf came to Chicago and started to take over, Muddy didn't like him too well. A kind of rivalry started up between them about who was the boss of the blues. After I went with Muddy, Wolf didn't speak to him no more. End quote. Different band members who would filter in and out of Wolf's band had different ideas about him as a band leader, but they all agreed that he was super strict. He knew that he and his band could be super successful, but he knew if they got a bad reputation, that would really hinder their growth. So he refused to let them drink on stage. He made them control themselves with the crowds. He made them dress a certain way, and he would regularly find them if they broke any of those rules. He was also pretty quick to get into physical fights with them if they started acting in any kind of way that he disagreed with. But most of the people who played with him thought that despite his rough and intimidating exterior, Wolf was a really kind, sweet-hearted guy who really cared about his musicians and loved them like a family. He genuinely wanted the best for his musicians, and he felt that his way of running the band was the best way to get them all where they could be. He also took really good care of his musicians in ways that other band leaders weren't even thinking about at the time. He made sure that they were all signed up to receive unemployment benefits if something happened to them, and also social security, which many of them continued to draw on long after Wolf died simply because Wolf forced them all to sign up for these programs. Throughout the 50s, Wolf had a string of successful blues hits, most of them written by Willie Dixon, who was kind of like the staff songwriter at Chess Records. Willie was from Mississippi, but moved to Chicago in 1936 in search of something better out of his life. He was a really big guy, so he became a pretty promising boxer, but left that career in 1939 after a dispute with his manager. He started focusing on music, becoming a part of a group called The Five Breezes, and he eventually signed to Chess as a recording artist. But by 1951, he was mostly doing administrative tasks and writing songs instead of actually, like, performing and releasing his own music. Because of the songs that he wrote for both Muddy and Wolf, he's considered one of the most important figures in the birth and development of the Chicago blues sound. By 1958, Leonard Chess's philosophy, Leonard Chess was the guy who ran Chess Records, his philosophy started to become really apparent. Leonard didn't care about hits. He didn't want to build a label that was searching for hits. He wanted to build a label that had consistent, steady sales. So instead of going for the smash and grab and we're going to just get a hit and make as much money as we can off of that song, he wanted to build long, stable, steady careers, even if the sales were kind of mediocre. And I think that philosophy really helped Wolf's longevity. It allowed him to keep playing the blues, keep making these records, keep having these sales long after a lot of his peers were forced to stop. So Wolf was on top of the blues world, but he was still feeling a little unsettled until he met Lily Handley. Lily was born in Livingston, Alabama in 1925. Her father died when she was two, so she and her mother moved into her grandfather's large farm. She married a local farmer named Nathaniel Jones in 1945. Their marriage was a little bit rocky. Lily spent some time in Chicago when they were separated, but she came back to try and reconcile and rebuild that relationship. They would have two daughters, and then Lily moved to Chicago for good, and the marriage dissolved. One night, Lily was brought along to a blues club where Wolf happened to be playing, and she said, 
a quote, Wolf was still doing his thing on the bandstand, but he kept cutting his eye at me. End quote. Pretty soon, they were dating and living together. In the late 50s, the music industry started to change, and Chess Records wanted to change with it. When people bought a record, they wanted more music for their money than a single could offer them, so Chess listened to the market and started releasing full-length albums. They tried it first with the jazz market that was kind of more willing to experiment, and when it was a success there, they brought it over to their blues artists as well. In 1959, they released Wolf's first album, Moanin' in the Moonlight. But ever the marketers, Chess wasn't exactly accurate in their description of the artist on the back sleeve. They wrote, quote, Howlin' Wolf is still a man of the soil. He was born in West Memphis, Arkansas, and in that country where he lives with his wife, he works a cotton patch of over 20 acres. He has several mules to help him with farming and other farm chores, end quote. Almost every part of that was untrue. Let's break it down. Uh, Howlin' Wolf is still a man of the soil. Well, that might be true. I don't know. You'd have to ask him. He was born in West Memphis, Arkansas. No, he was born in Mississippi. And in that country where he lives with his wife, does not live in West Memphis, Arkansas, was not married. He works a cotton patch of over 20 acres. Definitely did not work in any cotton patches at this time. He has several mules to help him with farming and other farm chores. Wouldn't make sense for him, for him to have mules or farm chores considering he didn't have or work on a farm. But whatever, the album was pretty successful. Even though Willie Johnson wasn't recording with Wolf much anymore, he was still the primary guitar player in the band, but Wolf finally had enough of his heavy drinking and his tendency to chase people with knives, so Wolf officially kicked him from the band for the last time. Despite all of this success in the 50s, Wolf recognized his own deficiencies and he started taking guitar lessons with a guy named Reggie Boyd, and he even started learning how to read and write a little bit better. In 1962, Chess released his second album, which is called The Howling Wolf, but is better known as the Rocking Chair album. It contained a song called Wang Dang Doodle, which became a minor crossover hit, charting high on the R&B charts and reaching number 58 on the Hot 100. Not long after that, in 1964, Lillian Wolf, after being together for like seven years, finally got married. Lily said, quote, I married him to help him because that is what he needed, and I'm so happy I did. End quote. She might have meant help him emotionally, but she also handled a lot of his bookkeeping, making sure he could stay independent from the chess brothers which was not true of a lot of the other chess artists they relied on the chess brothers for pretty much everything and wolf was very much independent from them she also helped him with his health struggles later in life Lily was a lifesaver for Wolf in a variety of different ways. In 1964, Wolf traveled to Europe for the first time and was blown away by how many people were Chicago Blues fans over there. After touring the continent for a little bit, he spent a lot of time in Great Britain, where many budding rock and roll stars had the chance to see him perform and were just so inspired by what he was doing. But as the European audiences fell in love with him, his audience back in the States had started to shift a little bit. Young black people weren't as interested in listening to their parents' old-fashioned music anymore. They were more inspired by that Motown sound and the soul music that was coming out of places like Stax Records. However, more and more white fans were falling in love with Chicago blues. Once again, Wolf was willing and able to ride that change and keep a strong audience despite the shifting landscape around him. Which was probably helped by some of the cool new young bands really loving him and singing his praises, particularly bands like the Rolling Stones. They had a hit in England when they covered his song Red Rooster, so when they were invited to play it as part of a TV show, they refused to do so unless Wolf was also there. So Wolf made his television debut in 1965, and apparently when it was aired, he was like asleep and Lily tried to wake him up to watch it, saying like, you're on TV, and he was like, I've already seen it. He just wouldn't even get up to watch it. As they both got older, the feud between Muddy and Wolf started to die down. And in fact, by the time they recorded Super Super Blues Band, which was like a collaboration between Wolf, Muddy, Bo Diddley, and Little Walter, Muddy and Wolf were pretty good friends. They still played up that rivalry for the showmanship aspect of it, but Muddy was regularly going over to Wolf and Lily's house for dinners. In 1968, Wolf went into the studio to work on an album that seemed to be made for those changing times, but was kind of something of a misstep. It was called Howlin' Wolf, but it's commonly known as the Electric Album, and is similar to the Electric Mud album that Muddy Waters put out in 1967. That album did not do well, but that might be partly because it was marketed very poorly. Marshall Chess, who ran the Cadet Concepts subsidiary label, which was the label that put out this Electric Album, made sure that the album cover said that 
Howlin' Wolf did not like this album. I guess he thought it would be like edgy and cool, but it just didn't make any sense. Marshall later said, quote, I used negativity in the title and it was a big lesson. You can't say on the cover that the artist didn't like the album. It didn't really sell that well, end quote. And that's a lesson that I think a lot of people don't have to learn, but I'm glad he got there eventually. In 1969, even if interest in blues music at like a global scale was lessening a little bit, Wolf was still one of the foremost names in the genre. And his legacy was further cemented by a lot of bands from the British Invasion celebrating him and talking about how great his music was and Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters and all of those people we've talked about already. But on a drive to a gig in Chicago, he suffered a heart attack and Hubert, who was driving, noticed that something was wrong and quickly got him to a hospital, which saved his life. The heart attack was probably brought on by undiagnosed high blood pressure and just years of hard living. But Wolf was not ready to accept a lot of the doctor's recommendations to kind of slow down and stop performing as much. You know I done enjoyed things that kings and queens will never In 1971, have. after another really strange and kind of disappointing album called Message to the Young, Wolf headed back to the UK to work on an album that at least had a lot of potential. It was the brainchild of a chess records producer named Norman Dayron who asked Eric Clapton how he would like to do an album with Howlin' Wolf. Eric Clapton, who got his start playing in blues bands, loved that idea. So they worked out the schedules and they sent Wolf and Hubert, who Eric demanded be present, to the UK to start working on this album. Word got out that they were working on this project and other massive British artists wanted to be a part, including Ringo Starr. But Ringo soon left after not liking how the session was being run, so instead they brought in basically the entire rhythm section for the Rolling Stones. The resulting album, The London Howlin' Wolf Sessions, released in 1971, and it really is a special record. It was Wolf's only album to appear in the top 200, reaching number 79. Despite his declining health, Wolf showed that he still had passion and he could still belt out with the best of them. Around this time, Gene Goodman, who was the brother of legendary musician Benny Goodman, came to visit Wolf and Lily. He convinced them to renew their publishing contract with ARC. After they signed the contract that they didn't fully understand, Gene pulled out a bottle of whiskey to celebrate. A few months later, Wolf suffered another heart attack. In the early 70s, during another tour of the South, Wolf saw his mother again for what I believe was the last time. He didn't have the best relationship with her. She was super religious, and she saw blues as the devil music, so she fully believed that he had sold his soul to the devil in order to make his fame and fortune in blues music. She refused any sort of financial help from him at all because she thought the money he earned was unclean. After they spent some time talking, Wolf tried to slip a little bit of money into her pocket, but she caught him and she threw the money on the ground and called him dirty before storming out. So the last thing his mother ever said to him, as far as I know, was calling him dirty. On New Year's Day of 1973, Wolf was heading home from a gig and then accounts vary as to what happened next. Wolf said, quote, There was about 200 cars, all going about 60 miles an hour in the same direction, and this one in front of me had to stop. So my car came to a sudden stop, and I continued forward through the windshield. They told me later I wound up in a field beside the road, but I don't know for sure. But Hubert said that Wolf told him a different story. He said that Wolf got out of the car to fight somebody, and that car accident itself was actually pretty minor. But... Either way, after that accident, Wolf's kidneys were completely shot. They were already pretty bad before, but after that accident, he was on dialysis for the rest of his life. And these kidney issues caused him to feel very weak, and it made it really hard for him to tour as much. In 1973, he went into the studio again to record what would be his last studio album, The Backdoor Wolf. Despite his feeble health, Wolf really gave some passionate performances on this album, even if it wasn't his overall best. In the fall of 1973, his son Floyd came to visit him, so Wolf got to spend some time with his son for the last time. Floyd said that when he was hanging out with his father, he felt a lot of intense darkness. Floyd was also a super religious person, and after that trip, he never saw his father again. But a little bit afterwards, he called Wolf because Elvin was having some pretty major health issues, so Floyd called Wolf in order to see if he could help with that. Wolf 
adamantly refused, so Floyd never spoke to his dad again. Wolf also decided to sue Arc Music, the publishing company that he had just re-signed with when Gene Goodman came to visit, and it was part of a whole batch of lawsuits that were brought against chess records and affiliates. Basically, these blues musicians felt a little bit exploited by chess records, and they wanted part of the money that they had hoped to make. I think what it really boiled down to was that the Chess Brothers, I don't think they ever intentionally meant to exploit anyone. I think they just got lucky and stumbled into a sound that got far more popular than anyone ever thought it would get. And it was mostly these artists saying, that might be true, but we still deserve our fair cut of it. But we'll talk more about that whenever I do a Chess Records episode. In November of 1975, despite really bad health and basically no energy, Wolf performed at the International Amphitheater in Chicago. It was a stacked show. He shared the stage with B.B. King, Luther Allison, and O.V. Wright, among many others. He, for the last time, mustered the energy to crawl around the stage and do his stage antics and perform like the old blues legend that he was. After the show, he was super exhausted and needed paramedic attention. They demanded that he be taken to the hospital immediately, but Wolf refused, saying that he wanted to stay there and listen to B.B. King because B.B. King was putting on a great show, and at least according to Lily, that was something that Wolf never did. Finally, Wolf agreed to go to the hospital, and on January 7th, 1976, Doctors delivered the devastating news that Wolf had a really, really bad brain tumor and he needed almost immediate surgery in order to relieve some of the tension on his brain. The next day, January 8th, 1976, Wolf's heart gave out during the operation. Hubert, who I think was traveling at the time, hurried back to Chicago and went to see Wolf in the hospital as soon as he possibly could. He said, quote, they had his eyes taped up when I got there. He was dead then. On January 10th, his family made the impossible decision to turn off the machines and end his life. He was 65 years old and he had spent his entire life doing everything he possibly could to bring the blues to people who desperately needed it. And that's the story of one of the most iconic figures in the history of American music. Let me know what you thought about it using the comments below. Leave a like if you liked it. and comment on any other blues musicians I should look into. It's a genre that I'm not as familiar with, so super excited to dig further into it.